So my first question is, who is the trans person in your life? Uh, my sister-in-law, my fiance's younger sister. How old is she? She just turned 20 uh, recently this past month, actually. This, this month, yeah. Oh, so, so pretty young. Yeah, she's she's really young, but say she's not much younger than us. And just for like reference, I'm a uh, I'm almost twenty three. <laughs> You're younger than me. <laughs> I always feel like slightly amazed when people are like getting married or having kids, and it's like I still feel like a child. How do you have a kid? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like really young, but um, I think for certain people depending on like if you want the same things obviously it can it can work out really well but I don't recommend that anybody just do what we did <laughs> so you guys are you guys are pretty close in age 22 almost 23 to 20 so how long have you known your sister-in-law uh as long as I've known my fiance so it'll be five years next next uh next year and when did she start identifying as trans I think uh, prior, before I met her, definitely then she was, I think she identifies as non-binary, but I know that like falls in that umbrella, like as they say or whatever, but uh, before that, and I think it was initially like just a name change and uh, pronoun, like preferred pronouns, but especially the name, like she was really adamant about being called another name. Did you, do you know if she has any mental illnesses or if she identifies or not identifies, if she is same-sex attracted? I know, right, I, as of what I have known recently, I, she has dated women. I don't know if she's dated men, but uh, she does have a history of, I think, um, depression, anxiety, like very general things that most people deal with but uh what what's it called uh uh I think she struggled with an ED growing up her uh my fiance did talk about that and we we do think she struggled with um her body image in that way particularly you know that's interesting because I feel like go back to when I was well when we were like in middle school or whatever eating disorders especially on like spaces like Tumblr were really popular like, I remember a lot of girls trying to become anorexic, like, just to have more control over their appearance. And I know it still exists. Like, if you go on TikTok, you'll see some of those women who do, like, the here's what I drink in a day. And it's, like, an excessive amount of liquid that's, like, really weird. And it's very obvious they're trying not to eat a lot. But it's not really the same sort of very obvious pro Anna rhetoric that there used to be. Now it seems to be more people who probably would have stuck with being anorexic or having uh, bulimia or leaning towards gender identity as a way to control their appearance. I, I absolutely agree there's a connect with that. Um, I'd say it's a trauma response as well to uh, abuse or particularly like when you're female experiencing misogyny and abuse from males, especially when it's your own family, male family members and, and whatnot. It's really sad because I think a lot of us, a lot of girls and women experience that. And it's pretty universal, but we don't always have the proper terms and language to talk about it. That is exactly the case. I feel like we have moved a lot since, you know, the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But in a lot of ways, we still lack the ability to describe our experiences and furthermore to connect it to a wider audience. Like most women kind of have a shared experience of oppression in some way, shape or form. But we don't always connect to the fact that it's not just you. You're not the only one who hates their body or who doesn't like this about themselves. And when, when you can find community, on one hand, you can have stuff like the pro Anna groups where it was like, ooh, back when Kick was popular, it was like, okay, show a picture of your body and I'll body shame you. We'll focus on becoming more in mentally ill together versus the other side of the spectrum, which is like, oh, we're sharing this experience. The problem's not us. It's the world. We can fix it. 
And I think that the trans community really falls into that sort of pro Anna community type thing where it's a pressure to continue being mentally ill, to continue reveling in dysfunction. And instead of seeking, you know, wellness, self-improvement, instead of focusing it outward on let's fix the world, it's instead, oh, the problem is you. So go on testosterone, go change your name, go do X, Y, Z. Yeah, I think it's wanting affirmation for those negative things and the self uh, perception that one would have with themselves. And honestly, it's easier to do that than to actually do the internal work to unlearn certain behaviors, to unlearn um, upset, like certain intrusive or obsessive thoughts. Like cognitive behavioral therapy would benefit a lot of uh, young men and women who struggle with mental health issues but especially those who struggle with body image issues you know because that overlaps with uh gender dysphoria and like people who are trans identified or non-binary identified or something like that so it sounds like you're pretty sympathetic to your sister-in-law situation but how has her identifying as non-binary impacted you and your fiance's relationship with her um to be honest it hasn't much, it hasn't really like we, I avoid pronouns at all costs because I just feel really weird calling all they or he. So I'll refer to her by her preferred name. But, uh, and he, he's the same, like he's very sympathetic and like he's not, obviously he's not female. So he doesn't 100% understand what we go through, but he, he's aware of of like what we experience and he he we deeply sympathize with, uh, with his sister but it, it hasn't like caused any like issues when we see her and spend time with her that's good i think that a, a trend that i've noticed with these interviews is that a lot of people who have family members who identify as trans in one way or another it's sometimes it can rip the family apart but i've noticed it's mostly the men who identify as trans who have that sort of effect with the females who have a trans identification it seems to be more like very obviously connected to mental health issues and there's more of a grace to dealing with them like yes it's sad but you don't feel imposed upon in the same way yeah i was gonna i was just about to say that um in terms of when a family when a relative is male and trans identified and I might it might sound harsh saying this but I, I do think because of male socialization and the way they're conditioned that stuff doesn't just go away like those behaviors aren't just unlearned or they're not corrected or they don't change for the most part they don't I think it uh, manifests in different ways like the aggression the entitlement the lack of boundaries things like that demanding certain special treatment like that you know just because of how they self-proclaim um their identity and it's not so much with with uh females who identify as trans or non-binary and it's definitely like that with my sister-in-law like i'd say we have a pretty good relationship but obviously ideologically there is a difference between how she views the world and how you do and you know i'm interested you have a daughter so how has being a mother kind of changed your perspective on gender ideology um well before i got pregnant with my daughter i was already uh peaking and reading a lot of different things and changing perspective about pretty much what we're talking about now in terms of like gender ide ideology and uh people who are trans identified but uh i guess i've i've become a lot more selfless and i've i've i wanted I want to raise my daughter in a way in which I view the world, you know, not exactly entirely, but I do want her to hold the same values and beliefs that we have for sure. But to not, like, I don't go out of my way to mistreat or disrespect people who are trans identified. Absolutely not. I would never do that. Uh, no point in that. And I would want to be able to teach my daughter that. I'm definitely more protective and I have nephews and a niece. So already I'm like 
protective of children because of that. I always have been, but. So a news headline, there's always these kind of cycles on trans kids, on trans families, and the impact that the gender ideology itself kind of has on mothers, particularly in a lot of countries, the US, Canada, UK, Australia, you'll see some hospitals and medical professionals refer to breastfeeding as chest feeding, or they'll put forward that rhetoric that men can have children too. And personally, I just think it's very silly and it's a little bit frustrating because not everyone has English as a first language. And if you're not someone who's up to date with all this stuff online or who understands, you know, what a what a cervix is or whatever, they're, they're cutting out a large population and kind of othering them. But obviously I'm not a mother and I was curious what your thoughts were on that trend of trying to be so inclusive that they kind of remove the female part from female experiences like motherhood, menstruation, menopause, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, if I talked about that in depth, we'd be here for hours, but to summarize it the best way I can, I think it's bullshit. I think it's very silly. I think it's very outlandish. I think it's very, I'm trying to find like a word to describe it. I think it's, it's disrespectful to women in general and like what we go through and these natural processes, which we experience because of our sex, they're just kind of like seen as like giving like, um, one thing I will mention is when I uh, when I was at the hospital in labor, you have to fill out some forms, like consent forms, and they inform you like what the birth plan is or what, what they can do in case something goes wrong or whatever. And one of the nurses, she asked me my pronouns, which I was kind of like, I thought she was asking my child's pronouns, <laughs> which like regardless if they were asking me or not, me or if it was child's, very weird because I'd like never since like doctor anything or anything for medical care like they never asked me that the only other time I was asked that was when I went to um a Planned Parenthood to to get uh to talk about like my birth control or whatever but it was just so bizarre to me it's like it's like yeah this this type of language isn't used towards men and people who are born male and I and like they don't use this this type of language to include, you know, it gets very weird. It's very strange. And and my mom, she's a, she was a CNA for 10 plus years and she's a hospice nurse now. She thinks it's all weird and strange because she's worked in the medical field and she's fully aware of, you know, what the differences are between men and women on a very basic level. But she just thinks it's very silly, this, a lot of the language distortion and the disregard for female bodily functions and issues and trying to make it inclusive for some women who feel like women or anything like that, but they will go through motherhood and go through pregnancy and birth, which are, you know, things that are exclusive to female people, and yet they still want to be called fathers. Anything but moms. It's very, it's very strange to me. Yeah. I've always thought that was weird because, like, I'm at that age where I've both worked with children for the past five years as a nanny and as a teacher. I've worked closely with mothers who are, you know, pregnant or they just had newborns. And, like, I've always found it so odd that you could do what is basically the most female thing of all, which is to create life, and yet so resolutely oppose acknowledging the reality of sex. Like, first off, you had to have heterosexual intercourse to become pregnant. <laughs> and then you just went through nine months of building a baby and then having it. And you still want to argue that, like, oh, I'm the dad. I mean, for whatever whatever name you want to go by to your kids, whatever. But, like, at least acknowledge that it's related to you being female. And then don't impress that the small minority their feelings and essentially delusions should take precedence over 51% of the earth's population. It's always, it's always been a pet peeve of mine as well, just because of how closely I've worked with children and just the 
utter delusion of I had a baby, but I'm the dad. No, you that's not how that works. <laughs> horse dad, them calling themselves seahorse dads, which is ironic because the 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 male this the male seahorses, they don't they they simply carry the babies. They don't necessarily I don't know if they they gestate them, but they carry the babies in a pouch and mother deposits the eggs into the pouch and the sperm mixes with the eggs and then it fertilizes them and then the, the, the eggs expel. So it's like, it's just weird that they even call themselves that, which I always thought was silly and funny, but I think motherhood at its core is sacred. And ultimately it's something we should all have a choice in, no matter like our circumstances or how a baby was conceived. Like every woman or girl who, who becomes pregnant should have a choice if she wants to do that. I wouldn't advise a child to go through pregnancy, obviously, or a teen girl, but forcing a girl to go through pregnancy or, or a woman, I think that's very horrific. That sounds like a nightmare. And I'm glad I was able to have a choice in my pregnancy. And I know many other women aren't, and they lose their lives because of it. And that's like happening in my state because um, of abortion bans and like restrictions or like that's a that's that's occurring here a lot of women are dying i have been looking into since since the roe v wade was overturned i've been looking at the stories that come up the tales that are utterly haunting because a lot of people first off the way that i view government in general is that you cannot put in authoritarian laws that benefit you because there's no guarantee that your party is going to remain in power forever. So if you want to put in a law saying, for example, you have to learn about the Bible in school because it's a religious text, well, maybe in 10 years, Buddhists will become the population, will be the majority, and they'll say you have to go learn about Buddhism in schools. And if you wouldn't like that, you can't force the same thing on other people. And when it comes to abortion in particular it's very very frustrating to me because a lot of people love to use justification for having bans on abortion and what it comes down to is typically just a they want to punish women for having sex and then b they love to have these well if it's rape or incest we can have a, a loophole and it's like you guys really don't know how that works do you because Typically, you're not, it's really difficult to prove that. And when it comes to stuff like miscarriages, a lot of doctors don't want to risk going to jail, losing their license for some stranger. And as a result, women are going to die because even if it's very obviously miscarriage, my child is, you know, dead inside of me. Person who really wanted a child could lose their ability to have one in the future or lose their lives. And it's, it's very frustrating that countries like Cambodia, Abortion is legal here. You can go to a clinic and go get one for a very cheap price. Birth control is easily available. There is a genuine effort to be able to control the population so that people aren't having children that they can't afford to take care of. And yet in the U.S., we're seeing this reversal of that, which has killed many women or destroyed their fertility or otherwise their autonomy. And I don't know, it's just very frustrating all around, especially because once the kids are out, they don't really seem to care. You can't force women to have babies, and then once the baby is out in the world, okay, screw you, child, go suffer. Yeah, it's very much like that um, in my state. Um, I don't mind saying where I live, but I, I live in Texas, so it, it it's a red state, obviously. And like the the this the major cities, like I live in Austin, Dallas, Houston, like cities are more blue so they're a little bit better in terms of at least being for women's bodily autonomy and then like on the other than however they're more okay with gender neutral bathrooms or whatever the fuck that may be um i i know two women uh well i didn't know them like that personally but they were friends of my my aunts she went to church with them and two of them experienced ectopic pregnancies and thankfully they didn't die from it but they uh one of the women she had to have her 
entire, I think, uh, I think one of her fallopian tubes removed and the other one, I think it ruptured and she had to get surgery. So, and uh, one of these women was already a mother to like two or three other children. So she could have lost her life had she not been able to get the proper medical care to, to take care of that. And she wanted that baby. Like both of these women wanted these, these children and out of their control that was taken away from them and their, their lives were almost taken. So like that really, it's very, it's very saddening. And I'm very grateful I didn't have any major complications or anything like that during pregnancy because I, I wanted my child so badly. And it sucks that uh, abortion access is, you know, being restricted or banned or it's like crazy that that's like that's actually happening today. What really gets me is that so many people complain about the population is dropping, women aren't having enough babies, and there are plenty of women who do want to have families. It's just they can't afford it or they have cases where it's taken out of their hands because you can lose your fertility with an ectopic pregnancy. You can lose your life. It's just very stupid to me that instead of putting money into supporting mothers and to having programs like free child care or, you know, having health care provided for mothers, it's instead we're just going to take away the choice and you can suffer. And then what gets me is a lot of the discussion around this type of thing it ends up being it ends up being very centered around other topics like instead of just saying women are losing the right to reproductive control which is very very important to being able to control finances your life education whatever it's always tied to gender and it's never women's rights instead a lot of these protests are women and other people are losing their right to abortion no it's it's all women this is a women's problem is it not enough that it affects women? We have to also make sure it affects other people for it to be worth fighting for. Yeah. And I think a lot of the same people who parrot that talking point, they conveniently forget that so many underage females, like teen girls and girls as young as 10, 11, 12, you know, being assaulted or, you know, accidents happening with their boyfriend or being preyed on by a much older men, almost like, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost half of all teen pregnancies are uh, fathered by men who are legally adults. And that's not talked about enough because you're as a, as a female, no matter what, you're going to be blamed for the actions of a male, no matter what. So it's easier to blame the female who became pregnant as just spawn the fetus on her own. Like the way we even talk about pregnancy and uh, women who particularly end up pregnant because they were being reckless or they or it didn't happen or whatever the case may be, it's talked about in a way as if it just happened on its own. Like she wasn't involved with anybody else. Like nobody else was involved. And I think that's very strange that pregnancy is talked about in that way. Yeah, especially because. It's definitely an age gap issue. Most teen pregnancies are fathered by men who are far, far older. And those men are not the ones who are blamed. And then part of it is also like the education on sexuality because I'm from Georgia and I distinctly remember when I was in high school, we had a health class and it was abstinence only sex education. And I was an annoying feminist even when I was like 17. So I had like a 100% in the class and then I refused to do the abstinence only section of work and my, my grade dropped like 20 points. But they didn't mention anything about condoms or birth control or actually how pregnancy works or changes the body. It was just, if you have sex, your dick will fall off. And if you're female, you will be pregnant and that is it. And obviously, like, if you're trying to keep something from a group, they're going to find other ways to get access to it, especially teens. So instead of learning factual information about STDs or pregnancy, instead a lot of teenagers get their education from pornography or they don't have any education at all and fumble into it and they have all these wives tales like, well, he can just pull out and it'll be fine. And then you end up with teen pregnancies. The good thing is that um, teen pregnancies have fallen a lot. There's a far less, uh, far less people are having pregnancies under 18, which is great. And that's one of the reasons why the population decline is happening is that women are choosing to have children at 
older and older ages and they're choosing to do so because they want the children, not because it's a consequence of sex. But whenever this discussion comes around, no one wants to point to the fact that like sex education would be supremely helpful and that the, it's not just, oh, teen girls and teen boys, it's teen girls and adult men. Yeah, um, I will mention this because it's relevant. Um, my father, uh, he, when he was in his about mid-20s, um, he got a underage girl pregnant, and that resulted in my youngest sister, who's now almost 14. And knowing that, obviously, like, I don't, I'm not contact with, I'm not in contact with my father. I haven't spoken to him in years. I haven't written to him in years. Um, it's pretty much dead to me, but knowing that really just like makes me feel sick, you know, and he has a track record of preying on young women and underage girls. And I won't get too much into it because it is kind of hard to talk about, but it's a really common occurrence and particularly um, I'm, my father's black and my mom's white. And I mention this because I do think frequently, like it's very common um, and within black communities for young girls and, and very young women. Like I, I wouldn't consider an 18 year old a woman, not even like, I just don't think that's a grown mature woman. Um, they're often blamed for being preyed upon for being pretty much manipulated into being with these men or, you know, force these men force themselves upon them and they get blamed for it. Like my, my great grandmother on my dad's side, she was 13 when she became pregnant. Um, and the father, the man, I don't know his name. Uh, he was well off into his mid twenties. And this was like in the, this was like a uh, deep South in like the 1940s, you know, 1940s. So it's just in a, I think she got blamed for it because she was bipolar. She was undiagnosed bipolar. And we know how like mental health in general was treated, especially amongst women and girls. Um, it wasn't seen as like a, you know, a distressing psychological thing. It's just like, oh, that's just, that's just how women are, you know? And so she was institutionalized. She became a mother very young and that was her life for I think majority of her life. I don't think she ever pursued education or uh, anything like that. I don't think she was able to. You know, that's really interesting because you are biracial in the opposite way that I am. My mom's black and my dad's white. And my mom's side of the family, there are so many women who had children at young ages and who ended up in abusive relationships to try to maintain a family structure. Um, One of my aunts had a series of abusive relationships, which she just couldn't seem to break free from. Like, she continued to come back to the same guys. Um, And then, similarly, another aunt of mine, similar story. And all of their children, they all have, um, one aunt has a son and a daughter. Her son is uh, schizophrenic because he endured abuse when he was younger. And then there's a heavy um, marijuana usage, especially in certain communities which can make it easier for you to reach that level where you become schizophrenic same thing happened to my other aunt she has two sons one of which is also schizophrenic and i've noticed that in the the black community in particular there's like a very there's a big reluctance to acknowledging a lot of things like the impact of having children at a young age or being in abusive relationships or the existence of mental health issues It's just very frustrating all around. It's very, very normalized. And on top of all that, there's like this weird obsession with fertility. Um, My mom waited to have me until she was 32 because she wanted to make sure that she was married, that she was, or if she wasn't married, that she could at least ensure that we were financially stable. And when she was throughout her 20s, a lot of her friends became single mothers and they would always be like, oh, you must not be able to have kids because you haven't had any yet. Like, there must be something wrong with you because you're waiting to have children until you're at an older age. All of these things make for such a perfect environment for abuse and for continual abuse to be passed down generation to generation. Absolutely. 
Wow, I'm like surprised like how much we have in common just from like our families. But um, my mom and dad, they were both in high school. And by the time they graduated, they had both my brothers. So my mom had both my brothers within like a short, she got pregnant three months after she had my oldest brother. So clearly they like they didn't have proper sex education from like just due to their upbringing and the lack of it being, you know, talk to them so of course they were gonna have sex and dumb teenagers you know so that resulted in that and uh my mom uh just to relate back to what you were saying about women staying in um abusive relationships to try and you know keep a family together just for the sake of that like my mom dealt with that for years with my father she did everything in her power to try and keep shit together and she did on even um, him staying at home with us to take care of us and to take up, you know, domestic labor in that role. And she would be fine working, you know, and just making sure that we were taken care of by our dad, but he didn't even want to do that. He didn't want to work, nothing. And my mom tried to help him. His mom tried to help him. He just never got better. It just got worse. And he blamed everyone but himself for the circumstances he was in all his decisions and choices. So it, it was never gonna work unless he actually cared to change himself. Have you also noticed like a trend of black women kind of giving excuses to black men? Like in my family, several of the guys have been, I would just say total failures. My uncle, he's in his fifties, still lives with my grandmother, doesn't pay any bills. She excuses all of his behavior because it's, well, he's having a hard time. He's having a difficult time. And yes, he has had a difficult time. His daughter was killed at age 17, back when I was like eight or nine. And the guy who killed her got off because it was very racially charged. He was a white guy. He got off, killed his girlfriend a couple months later. Um, Not going to say he didn't have a hard life, especially because of also his childhood. My mom all of her siblings grew up in extreme poverty but every woman in the family same circumstances faced abuse from family members sexual abuse had poverty all of them have jobs all of them have houses my mom is successful her two sisters are successful the only one who is unsuccessful in leeching is my uncle and he gets excused for it all the time by my grandmother and then the same thing goes for my aunts and their sons the one of my schizophrenic uh, cousins stole thirty thousand dollars from my grandmother, and they refused to report him to the police for it. The other one, he is unable to. He's basically a neat. He does have mental health issues, but he refuses to try. He doesn't take medication. Won't work. Won't do anything. Won't even do housework. And every time you bring up why are you letting this happen, but you refuse to support your daughters. It's, oh, well, they need extra help. They don't seem to recognize this weird double standard of, like, a boy can be a complete and utter pile of shit, and he will get all the help in the world. But one of, if their daughters needs anything, complete silence. Yeah, um, it reminds me of that quote um, that boys are loved and girls are raised. And essentially what that means is that basically everything you were just saying, like the infantilization of men. And as like, that's how they're brought up though. They're given more leeway, they're given more agency, they're given more autonomy, they're given more authority basically. Um, even in some instances when the, the girl is older than the brother, the sister's older than the brother, I mean, um, even then he, he still has more privileges just because he's male, you know? and um, that's a very common within within black communities even though i did primarily grow up around my white side because i lived with my white mother so naturally i grew up more around my white family but it's something i've observed and i i've talked to other people about it online um and i i'm very much in in i guess like black social spaces i i, I learned on channels and content like that even though it doesn't necessarily apply to me, I'm still curious and like want to know like what black women are experiencing because it's different from what other non-black women experience. And being biracial, it gives you a very unique perspective. But yeah, like uh, 
the my sister she has a four-year-old son and she does that with him unfortunately she and he's having to learn all these behaviors now for the past four years she's you know let him do whatever he wants give him whatever he wants whenever he throws a fit or tantrum and it's and me and my mom have both noticed this that he does not like uh he doesn't listen to us at all me and my mother it's specifically with us with us and we do think it's because we're women and this connects back to the fact that I think it's we think it's the men that my sister has put her son or she, the men she's interacted with and he is emulated. So it's really sad to see that my four year old nephew um, is emulating behaviors that are aggressive and violent. And it, it, I, I don't want to say it's misogynistic because I don't think he's aware of what that is, but it's clear that he treats female authority figures different from male authority figures. Well, you know, that's the thing that really gets to me is how early the socialization sets in. And it's not necessarily something you teach. Like, I don't think most women are trying to teach their sons, don't respect women, be violent, be aggressive. It's just that, for one thing, even at young ages, we can recognize the difference between male and female. And so when you have, for example, with mothers raising their daughters, a mother can raise their daughter and be like, yes, uh, be a scientist, learn to read, be super intellectual, do all these things. But if the daughter is witnessing her mother act in a certain way, for example, doing all the housework and doing all the cooking and cleaning, she's going to emulate the behavior, not the words that are being said. Like, sure, reading books and saying you can be anything are great things. But if parents refuse to emulate, to, to basically show the behaviors they want their kids to emulate, they're still going to pick up on that stuff. And so, like, with boys, you have to be really, really careful with who you let around your male children. Because you might not want them to pick it up, but they're still going to see it if, you know, boyfriend is calling you rude names or raising their voice. Or if, you know, the, your uncle or brother or whoever is physically abusive they'll pick up on that and of course those children aren't inherent like i don't think anyone is inherently born bad or born predisposed to be misogynistic or racist or classist no child is born automatically hating themselves or other people it all comes down to who you're learning from who forms that social group that the child is raised in absolutely and that's what me and my mother believe in um Right now, uh, my sister's not in his life. She essentially abandoned him. And my mom is in the process of trying to get conservatorship over him. So she, he at least is somewhere where he's safe and, you know, around people that will protect him and, like, you know, care for him like a child should. But um, I'm basically no contact with my sister now. And I did make that choice because it's just too too painful to even speak to her and I love my sister to death like we've been through a lot of shit together and our relationship has been extremely tumultuous and it was just recently it was just starting to get better like actually be healthy and then it just kind of fell to shit you know she's spiraling and um I worry about her a lot I really do but I I have to keep her distance from me and my family because she is unpredictable and um, she lies and I just don't want that in my life around my family or in my home. You know, I really think it's important to know where to set boundaries and where to keep them. And I'm really glad that you were able to identify that and to be able to set that boundary for yourself. And I think you have a good justification for it as well. I've noticed that a lot of people our age are getting more willing to cut off people, which on one hand is good that there's a recognition of this person is not healthy, I need distance. But on the other hand, I've noticed a lot of people are unwilling to essentially put in the effort to maintain relationships. So like, for example, um, cutting off a mother because they don't automatically support the new identity a child has, or being unwilling to just work through problems in general, um, like, I'm sure you've noticed the trend of, like, ghosting, not just, like, on dating apps, but just, like, friendships, too. A couple people who I've talked to have mentioned being friends with someone for years and years, and then all of a sudden there's, like, a disagreement. 
and completely dead silent not talking about it anymore like you just throw away years and years of friendship or any other kind of relationship over very small arguments yeah i lost a uh, quite a few quote unquote friends over that and i'm kind of glad though that i'm not you know in their circles anymore cuz it showed me like wow like we can't even have like a disagreement on these things but i'm i'm glad that i'm not friends with them anymore cuz i i don't want to associate with people who things like women's rights aren't a property and that we can just include anybody in that like people male and it's just the distortion of language the 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 way that they will get really defensive if you say basic things like sex is real gender's bullshit you know like and a lot of people are like that in Austin cuz it's fucking Austin but i'm very Collective of like who I get close with and who I talk to about certain things because it's not uh it's considered it's considered controversial I guess which it shouldn't be it's not controversial I don't think anything I I believe or say is is necessarily controversial it's just not the right quote unquote right opinion I I, I think that's what it is <laughs> and in certain people's eyes. You know, I'm curious, what does your um, fiancé think about all these different things? Um, like, what in particular? Well, let's start with the gender stuff first, and then I'm curious what he thinks about the behavior of the Black community towards women, if he has any opinion on that. Um, I'm not sure if he's too knowledgeable of that even though i have spoken to him about it and like my experiences that i've had with some black men and how they've treated me and like my father and and things like that uh and for reference he's white so his perspective would be very different from mine because i'm a biracial woman but he's very sympathetic and he's aware of domestic violence in general being an issue but when it comes to like uh relationships within black communities i think he's aware of that because i've told him about the mortality rate for pregnant black women and girls and like why it's so high and they're most likely to be killed by their partners um dv is kind of like brushed underneath the carpet you know within black communities women are expected to just take it and forgive men, you know, things like that. I'm sure he's like aware of like the surface level things, but when it comes to like gender ideology, he he's aware of like it's it's bullshit. You know, it's uh it's not really significant at the end of the day. Like he he's aware that sex matters and that him being male you know, grants him certain privileges, you know, the way he's treated and perceived. Um given automatically more respect and people take him more seriously like he's very aware of these things um and he's uh very very receptive to the things i talked to him about you know as i'm very passionate and obviously us having a daughter we want to instill instill her with certain ideas and uh have her be aware of what's going on and how she potentially might be treated we're not going to like train her to like be on edge and paranoid necessarily but to just be aware have discernment you know things that i wasn't granted just due to my upbringing and the circumstances so we just wanted to like do our best to prepare her but i could talk more about um his perspective on on a uh, any other topics that you're thinking about well, I don't want to keep you on too, too long. So I guess my last question is just, do you consider him to be a feminist ally? And do you think he considers himself to be one? Uh, I would say from my point of view, yes. From his point of view, I would say yes, but he never necessarily proclaimed that. But he's definitely, um, we, we, uh, we believe, like the core values of, of female liberation and, and radical feminism. Like we're pretty much, I'd say on the same page and he doesn't have an issue with it. And 
discussing it with me. Well, you know, that's good to hear. I do think that um, some feminists are really, really hardline, I would get, I would say. Like, they just completely, men are awful, they're all horrible, just not going to involve them in my life. But I've always thought, like, for the most part, most women are going to be attracted to men because heterosexuality is the norm. Most women, a lot of women, a large proportion of women have children. So the perspectives of marriage, male partnership, motherhood, these are all things that really need to be a focus of feminism, even if I personally am not going to partake because of the fact that the majority of women will. And it's always nice to know that there are guys out there who may not be, you know, the most politically minded when it comes to feminist topics, but they care about the women in their lives, be it their wives, girlfriends, daughters, mothers, etc. And I think that's a good starting point for making change that goes beyond the little internet sphere of weird feminists talking on discord <laughs> yeah again like uh, he's pretty close with his he's very close with his mother and sister and i see the way that he treats and in inter- inter- and that that makes me very happy because it's like that's a reflection of him and the way he treats me and our daughter like it's very reassuring like i feel very safe with him in pretty much every aspect and I could go to him for anything and talk his head off. But um yeah, he's I'd say he's he's uh an exception to the what what the standard of like a man is and like what we're expected to just uh like if you're a straight woman, I guess yeah, what we're expected to just not have too much of a high standards, but I think we need to have extremely high standards if you want to have children or cohabit with a man in a relationship with a man, like we need high standard. Um, yeah.